Good morning, and welcome back. I hope that all of you had a wonderful and relaxing summer. I hope you had the opportunity to practice some self-care, decompress a bit, and enjoy some well-deserved time with your friends and your family. This is an exciting time of year, but I'm also mindful that this can be a stressful time of year as well. All of you are working hard to prepare and finalize some of the last minute adjustments and details in preparation for the return of our students tomorrow. This is why I would like to begin today with a message of encouragement, positivity, and deep appreciation for every one of you and for all that you do. I want to acknowledge that this is going to be an unusual semester for all of us. This is a time of uncertainty and it can feel very unsettling. You might be coming back this year worried about your friends, your family, your colleagues, and our students. And much like all of you, I have similar concerns. However, as I reflect on who we are as a community and what you have all accomplished in the face of challenge and adversity, I feel hopeful as we begin this new academic year. As I mentioned in my very first message to all of you on July 6th, I am intensely aware that our campus, our larger community, and our nation are facing enormous challenges right now. In just my first seven weeks back to MCC, we have faced a series of major challenges, personally, professionally, and as a society. One of these challenges was the untimely passing of Earl Beeman one of our MCC Police Department officers. I would like to take a brief moment of silence at this time to remember his life, his dedication to our college, and as a sign of respect for his family, friends, and colleagues. Despite all of the challenges we have faced, I have had the pleasure of watching you rise to the occasion every single time. As you know, I am not new to MCC, so I'm aware of the challenges that we face. But despite all that we have been through, there is one thing about our college community that has never changed, and that is our unwavering resilience. No matter what is thrown our way, I can count on all of you to rise to the occasion. I understand that you need strong and compassionate leadership at this time, and I fully intend to deliver. I will do this by making decisions rooted in integrity. I will listen to you always, regardless of your position, rank, or tenure status. I will remain humble and inclusive. I will openly stand firm against racism, discrimination, or any other form of unethical treatment. I will stand up against bullying here and will protect those who are vulnerable. I will do what is right, not just what is easy. And I will actively listen to all of you. In fact, I have already begun to fulfill some of these promises. In just my seven weeks back to MCC, I have already met with dozens of you, both individually and in groups. This has given me the opportunity to hear about your concerns, your needs, and your ideas about MCC's future. I'm continually struck by the innovation you present when we have to quickly adapt to a new normal while always staying true to our mission. I'm thankful that so many of you have been willing to meet with me and express your thoughts, your ideas, and your concerns. And let me be clear, I have a very strong open door policy. And now I know we've had many leaders say this, so I will take it one step further. If you don't come to me, I will eventually reach out to you. 
as some of you have already experienced. And it's really because I want to hear from you. I want to know what ideas you have and how we can utilize your talents and skills to help advance and adapt our MCC community. Regardless of you being brand new to MCC or just a few years or less from retirement, I believe you all have something amazing to offer. It was during these meetings that a few themes did surface and I hope to address today, but I will continually address them throughout the year and beyond. I learned that some of you are feeling a bit uncertain about our new leadership structure and where we're headed. I would like to share with you a slide that outlines our new organizational chart showing from the CEO's office to the associate dean to help clarify things a bit. However, please know that my door is still open if you have more specific questions, comments, or concerns about the direction that we are headed. If you take a look at the slide, which hopefully all of you can see now, we have the Chief Executive Officer, and, and under that we have Karen Case as our Interim Executive Assistant. Our Deans, our Interim Dean of Academic and Student Affairs, Dr. Fatma Salman, she came on just this year. Dean of Administrative Affairs, Jim McDowell. Interim Dean of Student Affairs, Angela Simone, who I've asked to remain on with us through June to help transition into the Associate Dean of Student Affairs once we have that person in place. We have an Interim Dean of Institutional Advancement still, which is, remains Monique Wallenin. Director of Marketing and Public Relations is still Charlene Tappan, and Director of Public Relations, Michael Jordan Riley. We then have an Associate Dean of Academic Affairs, Pam Mitchell, and Associate Dean of Faculty, Mary Lou Vrendenberg. We also have a new addition of Associate Dean, not new to the college, but a new addition, Associate Dean of Continuing Education and Workforce Development, Mick Tiggett. And that is the end of the org chart uh, for this level. So we can certainly talk more about the details beyond that. Okay. The second concern I heard from you was about all of the uncertainty related to COVID-19. And I want to reiterate again that your health and safety is my number one priority and decisions will be made that reflect this priority. That will not change. I will continue to send out email updates about our procedures and plans as we move forward. We have also dedicated a website page called the COVID-19 Employee Resource Page that outlines important information for you to refer to, and I would encourage you to do so. Additionally, we held an open forum this summer with students to speak directly to them about our plans for reopening. And then we took time to answer their questions as well. My goal in general is to improve all lines of communication both internally and externally to our larger community. This brings me to the third concern that has surfaced through my open dialogue with you these past few months, concerns about diversity. I've had the pleasure of having countless conversations regarding diversity on our campus. And during those meetings, I have expressed my desire to embed a culture of diversity in all things that we do. This includes but is not limited to academics, assessment, general college policies, and ensuring we have as many diverse voices at the table as possible, because frankly, we make better decisions when we have a strong commitment to true diversity. I will work to ensure that this is reflected and represented in our leadership, as well as within our larger MCC community. We will do this by opening the lines of communication and by providing the opportunity and space to engage in the tough conversations. I will actively seek out the expertise of diversity leaders in the community and will never become complacent in this work because there is still so much to be done. One of the community leaders I have already had the pleasure of connecting with is Executive Director Stephen Hernandez of the Connecticut Commission on Women, Children, seniors, equity, and opportunity. He and I had a long discussion about the importance and value of true diversity and how to continually improve our culture of diversity at MCC. 
Personally, I have found Mr. Hernandez to be an engaging and talented speaker, and I felt strongly that we would benefit from hearing his thoughts and perspectives today. So thankfully, he graciously agreed to being with us today, and I would like to offer a brief introduction of his bio before then turning it over to him. Mr. Hernandez previously served the Connecticut State Legislature as Director of Public Policy and Research for the Connecticut Commission on Children. Prior to joining the commission, Mr. Hernandez served seven years as Legislative and Budget Director in the Office of Washington, D.C. Council Member Jim Graham. Mr. Hernandez served as a clerk to two judges in the District Court of Appeals and as a consultant to, the, to a Washington law firm. He received his Bachelor's of Arts degree from Bennington College in Vermont and a Juris Doctor degree from the Washington College of Law at American University. I will now turn it over to Mr. Hernandez so that he can talk more about his dedication and experience with diversity, equity, and opportunity. But I want to thank you all for being with us today. And again, I want to wish you a wonderful start to the academic year. And I hope you enjoy the rest of our program today. Dr. Esposito, first of all, thank you so much uh, for having me here in, in your home, uh, your new home. Uh, I am in, in many ways a neighbor of the college. I'm, I'm literally a neighbor of the college. I live right nearby. And uh, I know this college so well in so many ways. I, I bike ride around it. I run around it. Uh, I know uh, former students. I know people who teach here. Uh, but this is my first time in the actual buildings of the college. Uh, so this is very exciting and I'm, I'm really grateful to be here. I feel like uh, an invited guest to, to a dinner conversation uh, among friends. So well, thank you for your very gracious welcome. Uh, I, I wanted just to, just to welcome all of you uh, and to, in some ways, just tell you a little bit about the context of Connecticut as I see it in the work that I do. As Dr. Esposito said, I run an agency of the Connecticut State Legislature, and the agency is an agency which really does focus on equity and opportunity. And uh, that's important to us for a couple of reasons. We have a, a very long history as a set of commissions of the legislature. The very first commission that was created of the legislature was the commission, the permanent commission on the status of women almost, uh, almost four decades ago. That commission was followed by the Commission on Children, uh, for which I served for a few years, and there were several commissions that followed. Uh, among them were the Black and Puerto Rican Commission that focused on Black and Puerto Rican uh, affairs, um, African American affairs, uh, Latino and Puerto Rican affairs, and Asian Pacific Islander affairs. Each of these commissions ended up being six. Each of this focused on a particular segment of underserved and underrepresented people in the state of Connecticut. What we learned over the years as independent commissions that focused on these siloed issues is that the issues that impacted people of color, the issues that impacted children, the issues that impacted women in the state of Connecticut, these issues were not different one from, but the fact that there were different commissions was really a consequence of what Connecticut was and how it saw itself for so many years. I've often said that Connecticut is a microcosm of the rest of the country, and it really is. You know, I'm a, I'm a Texan originally, and I'm, I'm very happy to be here now. Uh, but as a, as a former Texan, there are places in Connecticut that really ring of Texas. Uh, a few years ago, I brought my family here, and we went to the Durham Fair. And to be able to experience a rodeo, a real honest-to-goodness rodeo, uh, in Connecticut was something that we rarely even did in, in Texas, but it reminded me that Connecticut is really a study of microcosms. And when I look across Connecticut, I see some of the wealthiest, some of the most uh, uh, um, connected, some of the most impactful people in the state. I see entrepreneurs in our families that live in Hartford and struggle to make ends meet. I see leaders in our families that live in, in, our, in our suburbs who are trying to rebuild from years of, of, of neglect in their uh, in their building infrastructure, years of, of statewide neglect and in investing in communities, I see leadership. So as the, as the commissions over the years developed and as we um, began to really see the intersectionality of the work, ultimately the commissions began to consolidate. Uh, 
And I don't mean the physical consolidation that happened most recently, but the consolidation of ideas, the intersectionality of the work, the real understanding that our people are not siloed and our issues are really connected. And as that intersectionality really developed, we started to see the connection between peoples of color in the state of Connecticut, a shared struggle. The connections between people who were struggling uh, to make ends meet in a city and people who were struggling to get to different opportunities in the suburbs. We started to see the connections between different parts of Connecticut and the peoples of Connecticut. And in that, in those connections, we learned some some key um, some key uh, uh, principles that I bring with me uh, to work every single day. The very first principle is that in order to meet the people of Connecticut, you need to meet them where they are. You know, I think of Connecticut as as, as five different places. Uh, you have the quiet corner, which is you know, filled with uh, rural rural opportunity and people who really need uh, just a hand up. Uh, you have the cities of Connecticut that are sometimes even more isolated than those rural areas. You have our corridors of opportunity in our in our uh, in our highway system that really take us from town to town, from the most southern part of the state to the most northern part of the state. And what we realize is there there is so much more that unites us that doesn't. When my commissions finally consolidated into one commission and I was finally able to see under one umbrella all the different peoples that really populate uh, the state of Connecticut and all of the needs that are really so interconnected, all of the opportunities, all of the, uh, the skill that our people in Connecticut bring to the table, it's then that we started really to understand the depth of the work that is necessary here. You know, when I think of Manchester Community College, I think of the community college as a microcosm of the rest of the state. Uh, you know, I think of, you know, I, in my conversations with Nicole, I see the leaders that are working here in the state, the practitioners that are working here at the community college. I see the students that come from, so, from far and wide just for the opportunity to learn, to have that first step into their own independence, that first step into their world. And then I think about the last few months. The last few months have been difficult for each of you and for all of us. They've been difficult because it's really undone, I think, some of the steady habits that Connecticut uh, was so committed to for so many decades. It's undone our notion that the way things are is okay. It's undone our notion that uh, in order to connect, uh, there are only certain ways that we're allowed to connect. But what it's done is it's created opportunities for us to really think outside of the box, uh, which is really interesting because so many of us are caught in these little boxes these days. But imagine human possibility has been unleashed by the fact that we can't be tangibly together, physically together. Now we see that true connection and true empathy is something that we create together. Now we see that true opportunity is something that doesn't need to be constrained by the places and spaces that we are from, but it's really the, the places and spaces that we occupy today. And what's really exciting is that over the last few months, as we have reorganized our work at the Commission in serving people, we realize that when you think about a seat at the table and how, is, how it is that we uh, ensure that we have true diversity at our tables, that we have true inclusion at our tables, we realized that our table was all wrong to begin with. There were never enough chairs. There were never enough rooms to hold all of us. The, the idea that we can you know, put all of us in one room and, and have enough space around a table to hold the diversity of ideas that we are all possible of. And by the way, the amazing thing that happens when we work across difference and when people come together, just the very notion that we thought we could hold it all in one place is where we got it wrong to begin with. And the idea that leadership and the idea that that connection, the idea that uh, franchise was something that was limited and only available to the few is now dashed. And the possibility that each of us is a leader, each of us is a representative of the spirit that we bring into this college, that we bring into the state and that we bring to each other. That's what's really exciting about what we've experienced in the last few months. So. I look back at the early part of my career in the state of Connecticut and I think, you know, there was so much effort that was done, firstly, in understanding the different silos of need and opportunity, 
there's so many things, amazing things that happened because of necessity that kind of brought us together by force. You know, my little agencies being a, a tiny example of that. So many things that have forced us to have difficult conversations in the state of Connecticut, but never before have I seen the opportunity for all of those things so presently as I see it now. People are talking to each other who have never really even shared a meal. People are dreaming together who have never even understood what it was like to see each other face to face. All of the assumptions about who we are from a distance have now been dashed. And the opportunity for us to be able to actually talk to each other is so amazing. So Nicole, when I spoke to you the other day and when I, and when I, I thought about the way in which you approach leadership, and that is leadership through listening, listening through with empathy, with the goal of connection, that is really the critical new normal, I think, that we should all be aspiring for. And so when, when you asked me to come and talk about diversity and inclusion, I thought, imagine the landscape that is this university, not only the landscape of its leaders, not only the landscape of its students, but the landscape of this beautiful land that it's built on. Each one of us brings something critically important to a table that is unbound by space and time. Each one of us brings our expertise in being connected that we have developed keenly over the last few months, not because we wanted to necessarily, but because we had to. So I'm really excited for this college and, and, and my neighbor, Manchester Community College, because I see the beautiful possibility, this little microcosm of Connecticut, and in that way, a microcosm of the rest of the country, you can be a shining example in this state for how to do this, which is communicating with each other empathically, and how to do it right, which is reaching out across silo, across distance, and connecting as tightly and as purposefully as we can. So thank you so much, Nicole, for having me here today. It's a real honor to be able to speak with all of you. I can almost feel you uh, out there. I can feel the anxiety, I can feel the excitement, but I can also feel the promise that each of you brings. So thank you. Thank you, Stephen. Now we're going to, um, next is going to be Christopher Hamlin, and he's gonna talk about achieving the dream and um, Wanda Ray's Dawes. Hi everybody, um, in case you don't know who I am, uh, like uh, Karen said, I'm Chris Hamlin. I'm Professor of Mathematics here and the faculty co-lead for our Achieving the Gene project on campus. Next slide, please. So we are in our second year of Achieving the Dream and last year we formed our core team and on the screen you see the core team from last year. And I want to thank everybody uh, for all your hard work that you've all done as part of the core team so far. I'd like you to also note, oh, don't go back, please. Sorry. That's okay. I'd like to point out uh, that our core team really is made up of a, a diverse group of staff and faculty. We have people from advising, admissions, IR, faculty, administration. A few members have left the team since last last year. Uh, they're marked with a star. They will be definitely missed. Um, however, Sarah Perez uh, recently went to Middlesex, I believe, and she was our staff lead. And I'd like to welcome Wanda to the team as our new staff co-lead. Thank you, Chris. All right, next slide, please. So, some of you might not be completely familiar with what Achieving the Dream is. Uh, Achieving the Dream is a nationwide community, um, a network of colleges that we are now a part of. With this network, we'll be able to lean on the collective learning of all of these over 250 institutions. Right now we're in year two of our multi-year initiative. Year one was a building year, a year of organizing and uh, data gathering. So far we've gathered data from faculty, staff, and students. This is our 
uh, second year now, and year two will be much more of an action year. Unfortunately, we weren't able to complete all of our work from last year due to the campus closing. Um, so we will start this year by completing some of the projects that uh, we weren't able to complete last year. And I'll get uh, more into those soon. Now, all of our Achieving the Dream work is centered on the question of equity. And we will really be making equity, uh, the question of equity, a key part of all of our de decision making. Next slide. So what is equity? Well, equity, I don't want you to confuse that with equality. Our school offers open access. Every student already has access to walk through the door, equal access to walk through the door and get an education here. So we already believe in equality. We already do that. But if you look at our graduation rates and you look at our achievement gaps, simply having equality, equal access isn't enough. We are losing students at various points along their educational paths. So instead of just being okay with equal access, we really need to ask, what are the particular needs of the various students coming here that prevent them from having academic access, success? And then we need to work to break down those barriers. I'm gonna read a, uh, a portion of the equity statement from our system. It says, equity is not diversity. Equity is not equality. Equity provides students with the necessary resources to achieve their educational goals, regardless of when they begin their educational journeys or the obstacles they might encounter. Equity in education demands placing support systems in line to guarantee all of our students have an opportunity to succeed and thrive. So it is our obligation to provide an environment where students can learn and thrive no matter what obstacles they bring through these open doors. Next slide. So I'd like to summarize some of the things we were able to get accomplished last, last year. Um, so of course we organized our core team. We were able to gather student data uh, and special thanks to David Nielsen and the SGA for the efforts in this. One of the uh, big goals from last year was to complete the ICAT survey, the Institutional Capacity Assessment Tool. And we had over 100 faculty and staff complete that assessment. So thank you for all those who were able to do that. And what the ICAT is, is a survey that helps colleges determine their institutional capacity in seven key areas, leadership and vision, data and technology, equity, teaching and learning, engagement and communication, strategy and planning, and policy and practices. The Achieving the Dream National Organization has shown that these key capacities must be in place for the cultural change that is required to improve student outcomes equitably and sustainably. This assessment has been completed by over 200 colleges nationwide, and their experience has shown that has enabled their college-wide teams to discuss their strengths and challenges and helped inform student success priorities. Back in February, the, uh, a good portion of our core team was able to make it to uh, the annual DREAM conference. And I wish everybody was able to attend. It was so inspiring and it really lit a fire under me and made it a moral obligation for me and hopefully I can uh, instill that in all of you to help these students in their journey here. And right before campus closed, we presented departments and programs with their own uh, course pass rate data. And we asked them to analyze the data and look for some some ideas for possible solutions in the achievement in achievement gaps. We broke down this data, disaggregated it uh, 
by certain key demographics. Unfortunately, though, the campus was shut down soon after the data was provided and, and many uh, departments were not able to complete the work on this project. So we will be uh, asking you guys to look at that again coming up. Next slide, please. So for this upcoming year, uh, we don't have uh, too many things planned formally yet. We are going to use the results of that department level course pass rate data and the ideas that you guys come up with to help inform what our action plan will be for this upcoming year. Another plan, uh, a big part of planning this uh, following year will be the World Cafe. World Cafe will be on September 24th, and that's where we'll discuss the ICAT survey results that you all took in February. So the ICAT is our chance to review and discuss, I'm sorry, the World Cafe is a chance for us to review and discuss the ICAT results. From this cafe, we will you know, prioritize some action items for our ATD team to work on. And this World Cafe is open for to everybody to attend and participate, and we want as many people there as possible. The more people, the better from all parts of the college. We want your opinions and your ideas. And we'll be also looking at if there were any equity issues from moving all of our courses online in the spring summer and, and this fall as well due to COVID-19. And all these three things will inform our action plan and we'll have some more solid activities for the next year or two from that. Next slide please. So that kind of wraps it up for me. If you have any questions, please don't hesitate to contact me or any of the core team members at any time. And if you want to help our projects, our initiative, please contact me or again, any of the team members. Thank you very much. And I'd like to add, Chris, if you don't mind. Absolutely. Um, we, we are in need of some note takers and facilitators for our World Cafe on September 24th. So if you're interested, please let Chris or myself know so that we can uh, make sure that you're um, able to help us with that uh, endeavor. Thank you. Thank you guys. Now we'll go have my panic attack alone. Thank you, Chris. Next is going to be Patricia Lindo. To talk about um, new hires and retirees. Thank you, Karen. So this this year we had a few people retired. Mm -hmm. uh, David, David Flynn, system analyst, retired July 1st, 2020. George Kim, professor of philosophy, retired August 1st, 2020. Donna Nicholson, Professor of Criminal Justice, retired August 1st, 2020. Arlene Paderick, Fiscal Administrative Officer, retired August 1st, 2020. And Joy Doran, uh, Education Assistant, Web Content Developer, retired August 1st, 2020. I'm sorry, there's a typo there. It should be August 1st. It says March. Please excuse that. Right now in process, we have two upcoming retirements, and that's Wanda Haynes, professor of English. She'll be retiring a few in about a week, September 1st, and with 30 years with the, with the college. And then Donna Nicotera, secretary two, will be retiring October 1st, 2020, and she's got 30 years across the state, uh, not only at MCC, but other agencies that she worked with. Next slide, please. Our new hires that we've had recently were Karen Collin. She's going to be working in with the TRIO area and with the STARS program as the SSS program specialist, and that's going to be math focus. And she will start on September 11, 2020. As you know, our CEO, Nicole Esposito, started with us July 6. Elizabeth Rigonis will be starting August 28 as a financial aid assistant. Robert Lejoy Jr custodian started when COVID began on March 13. So I know a lot of you guys have not been able to see him, but he started right when we went out for, for COVID-19. 
Rena Peralt will be starting on September 11th also, and she's the SSS program specialist and will be the generalist in that area with under the TRIO grant. Catherine Player, financial aid assistant, will be starting uh, this Friday, August 28th. Jeanette Rivera Epps will be starting this Friday, August 28th as the Interim Associate Director of Admissions. And Mary Lou Rindenberg, who's been with us right when COVID started as well, um, as the Associate Dean of Faculty uh, started on February 14th. I know many of you have had the opportunity to work with her and, and know who she is at this point. So welcome to each of our new hires that are here now and will be started in the next few weeks and months. Thank you. Next slide. New hires part-time educational assistant that took place. All of these hire pretty much took place when we were out working remotely. Awa Jop, academic advising assistant. Maria Koistinen, academic advising assistant. Joyce Lilidal, past grant specialist. Gina Marshashani, academic advising assistant. Michael Michno, circulation assistant. Welcome to our part-time EAs that again started while we were all out working remotely. Next slide. So we've had some internal moves and I'll also provide uh, updates on the searches that we ha have uh, currently. So we had um, again, all of these were taking place remotely, all these searches. And as you can see, there's there are a lot of them. Um, and I'd like to thank Sophia Bonilla. I'm not sure if she's on the call today, but I uh, just want to thank her for all her efforts in working through all of these searches remotely. It's been a challenge for her. And as she moved on to her new um, new opportunity with the system office as a labor associate, we'll definitely miss her assistance in doing all these searches. Uh, she was very, very uh, good at working through all of these, despite some of the challenges that came along. So the internal move that we had, uh, Sandy Brown, academic associate, academic affairs. Sandy started in that role June 19th, 2020. Benjamin Brault, a gear up coordinator for the gear up program, started in that role July 17, 2020. Yalis Marie Cullen, Bursar Services Assistant, is in the uh, financial aid, fi I'm sorry, financial uh, services, administration services, started in that role June 5th, 2020. Catherine Del Gazio, she's the interim academic assistant, also the culinary lab manager in the social science area. She started in that role as the interim person as of March 13, 2020. Daniel Finnegan, skill maintainer in the facilities planning, started in that role uh, April 10th, 2020. Robert Gadir, building maintenance supervisor in the facilities planning department, started in that role also April 10th. Nicole Goulet, lecturer in psychology and social science division, will be covering for Francine Roselli as she's now working over at the system office. Nicole is a part-time lecturer and will be transitioning into that role as lecturer of psychology for the year. Marissa Morales, library assistant in the library, started in that role on May 8th, 2020. Mick Piggott, associate dean of continuing ed and workforce development, the continuing education department, started in that role July 3rd, 2020. Cora Ortiz, Bursar Services Assistant in the Finance and Administrative Division, I'm sorry, department started in that role June 5th, 2020. Fatma Salman, Interim Dean of Academic and Student Affairs, started July 31st in that role. And Patricia Vale, Bursar in the Finance and Administrative Services area, started in that role in uh, February 28th, 2020. Again, let's congratulate these people, our new hires, full-time EAs, and all these internal moves that we've had. Congratulations to everyone. Searches that we have in progress right now, it's an academic advisor that will be posted uh, today. The Associate Dean of Students, the Dean of Institutional Advancement, Police Officer, Secretary One, and SNAP Coordinator. So all these searches are currently in progress right now 
for our committee, for the search committee to review applications and then schedule interview as soon as we possibly can get started. Thank you. Next slide. Just a quick update and reminder, human resources, DAS in service training, registrations is due to Beverly Frigno August 17th. There is still time to register by September 1st. If you're interested in taking any of those classes, please reach out to Beverly Frigno. Effective October 1st, all health benefits for active state employees and their dependent through the state of Connecticut will now be administered by Anthem. United Healthcare will continue to provide coverage for retirees. So everyone that's in Anthem will remain in Anthem. If you're in United Healthcare, you will automatically transfer into the Anthem plan that's similar to what you had as United Healthcare. Open enrollment will begin September 1st. Please contact Donna Gibson with any questions. And later today, the virtual enrollment uh, schedule will be meeting schedule will be sent out so that you can see where these enrollment will be taking place at virtually. Um, the schedule again will be sent out today and there are lots of places that's on the list. So if you can't make the one that's scheduled for MCC, you certainly can join in on one of the other virtual meetings that will talk about the enrollment period with all, all of the healthcare moving over to Anthem Blue Cross Blue Shield. And just so you are aware, the CSCU HR Shared Services has been moving along. There are five centers of excellence that's been set up. There's a compensation benefits, HR administration, talent and recruitment, diversity and inclusion, labor relations, and HR strategy. The Capital East Region HR contacts, if you have any, um, any, any reason to contact any of us in the East Region for HR, please feel free to contact the regional HR manager, and that's Kimberly Carolina, and her email address is listed there. And um, myself as the CSCU Regional HR Generalist, please feel free to reach out to either one of us with any questions about anything as the transition takes place with centralizing all of the HR processes through the system office. Next slide, please. And thank you all. Have a great semester. And again, you know how to reach myself or again, Kim Carolina, if you have any questions about HR or anything you'd like to um, follow up on, please feel free to email me or to give me a call. Thank you and have a great semester and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you, Patricia. You're Next welcome. is um, Sarah Vincent in regards to an enrollment. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. So uh, CEO Esposito had asked me to give a quick enrollment update this morning. So I thought we'd start with what everybody wants to know, and that is taking a look at our current numbers. Um, so what you have here on your screen is our current fall 2020 numbers as of this morning. So you have our FTE, which is 2,724 and our headcount, which is just shy of 4,500. So uh, right now that is putting us down at about 14% in FTE compared to what our numbers were in fall 2019. Um, definitely not great, not where we want to be, but it is light years ahead of where we were just about a month or a month and a half ago. So next slide, Karen. So, this graph is something that I know we've all seen before, and it's something that David Nielsen has shared in our in our fact book. Um, but I think it's important to share with you all um, because while our numbers seem drastic, being down 14%, I think it is important to note that we have been on a steady decline since our peak of 2012-2013. Um, so we have been declining for the last seven or eight years. Now. Uh, we'll speak to some of the challenges that we've seen this year, but overall we know enrollment cyclical. It has a lot to do with the economy, with high school graduation rates and things like that. But I think it is important to note that if we want to start changing this and turning things around, we do have to kind of make some institutional changes as well. Next slide, Karen. So I want to talk a little bit about our applications. 
um, and our yield rates, because our yield rates are what we look at internally in enrollment services, and that is basically the percentage that we're converting our applicants. So what you see on this slide is the number of applications that we've received for new first time students and then also transfer students coming transfer students coming into the institution. So you can see we've we've admitted just about 36 3700 students, which is about on par with where we've been in years past. Um, and our percentage, our yield rates are a little lower than we um, hope for. Now I will say we should see a couple percentage points increase because we do pick up a lot of students during this last week during um, the ad period. So right now for new and transfer students, our yield rate is about 42% and we typically look for about 45 to 50% for an overall yield rate for those. The same is true with our continuing students. So right now we are just shy of 3000 continuing students which is about 55% of the number um, that we had last semester. And we look for a goal there of about 60 to 70%. And that's our retention numbers. And that goes a lot um, <clears throat> into course availability, um, satisfactory academic progress. It speaks to some of what ATD is working on in terms of equity and getting students to that finish line. Um, so those are the numbers that we use internally to look at. And it's important to know what those conversion rates are because that's where we can really start to enhance our enrollment pipeline and fix things that we know might be challenges for students. Next slide. So I wanna take a minute and stop and talk a little bit about our enrollment pipeline. As many of you know, um, the first step to attending MCC is an application. Second step is to be accepted slash admitted. And then the final step is to be enrolled, to actually matriculate and take courses. Next slide. And I bring this up because there was a big change in the application process in the beginning stages, as well as the acceptance and admit process this year. So I know some of you had heard us talk about it either in the PAC meetings or in enrollment management meetings, but the admissions office system wide um, has finally gotten a CRM. And what that is, is uh, it's a basically customer relationship management and it basically allows us to track students through the prospecting stage, the inquiry stage, through the application stage, all the way to a matriculated student. But there is a downside to it. And that downside is, is our applications are now 100% completely online. Um, and that's been a challenge for our students. Now it's been beautiful because of limited access with COVID. However, many of our students are very used to just walking into the admissions office, filling out an application and going on, excuse me, to the next stage of the enrollment cycle. Unfortunately, they now have to fill the application out before they come to campus. Or if we were open, we could have them use the kiosks on campus to do it. With that, and with the application process also comes a new student portal where students can actually upload their documents. Um, it's secure, it's in the enclave. So if our IT folks are on the call, there are no more social security numbers via mail, fax or email, um, finally. Um, so it is a beautiful tool for students, but it is also a learning curve um, because it is something that's brand new for us at the college. Um, and with that, that actually transitions into the second big change in the accept and admit process. Next slide, Karen. So previously, when students were doing paper applications or mailed applications, as soon as we got an application, it was processed and a student was admitted immediately. Currently, with the online application through the CRM, a student submits their application and it, uh, their status will sit as application submitted. And then they're asked to upload their supplemental documents. And those supplemental documents are immunization records and proof of high school graduation. Previously, students had until September 15th to submit those documents. Now they are not admitted to the college until they submit those documents. So that's another big change. And it is definitely one that has caused some bottlenecks in the enrollment process. 
Now we do have the ability to go in and manually override that, which we did do, for example, for students to meet the PAC deadline by July 15th, um, but it does take a lot of manual labor. So that's another big change that it's important for folks to understand is that the process isn't so much automatic in that students really do need to put the effort forward um, before they are admitted. In the long run, this will actually help our yield rates because it does weed out some of those students that had no intentions of intending. But for right now, with some of the other challenges that we're having with, with COVID and limited access to campus, um, it is a challenge for some students. So we have ended up waiving a lot of those requirements, uh, particularly immunization records as doctor's offices have limited um, hours as well. Um, so again, timing not perfect, but all in all, it will be a, a fantastic tool moving forward. Next slide. So the final stage of the process is the admitted to enrolled. And this is one where I wanna take a little bit of time um, because this is where it becomes very important and it takes a lot of cross collaboration across campus. So when a student submits an application and is accepted, one of the first things that the admissions office and, and the testing office currently look at is course placement. Now in our traditional ways of operation, we would have students sit for an AccuPlacer uh, test if they didn't meet the requirements based on SATs. In our current environment, that's not an option. Um, so there are new placement guidelines that were put forth by the system office in early, late March, early April. Um, and I think it's important, especially for faculty to know if you're checking course placements for students, you're gonna see about six different codes that you're probably not used to. So in an effort to maintain multiple measures, uh, placement right now is being based off high school GPA and or SAT scores, and also self-reported high school GPA. So you might see that in there as well. We also have our traditional SAT scores, ACT scores, um, and then obviously previous uh, college credits or AP scores, things like that. Um, so the placement piece is definitely something that is um, a cross collaboration and a little bit of a challenge currently because it is coming in from so many areas. Um, the second piece between admitted and enrolled, and this is uh, specific to transfer students, is the transcript evaluation. Transfer students, while they can be admitted without having an official transcript on file, we, and by we I mean the admissions office, um, cannot transfer in credits without having an official transcript. Right now we're very fortunate that the majority of schools are using digital transcript delivery which means we get them in 24 to 48 hours. So the process is pretty quick, but if schools are relying on, on USPS, the transcript evaluation process does tend to take a little longer. Then the final stage, once placement has been determined and credits have been transferred in for transfer students, that final stage in the key component to becoming an enrolled student is really the transition to new student orientation for new students or academic advising for continuing students. And that piece is really critical um, for students to become enrolled and become matriculated students. So as you can see, this piece of the enrollment pipeline really relies on a cross collaboration within student affairs and academic affairs to ensure that all these critical components are being met. Next slide. Thank you, Karen. So I talked a little bit about the challenges that we've been facing. Um, I put COVID on here because it would be, I, you can't ignore it. However, system-wide enrollment numbers are down. So for, for MCC to say that COVID and COVID protocols are the reason enrollment's down wouldn't be a fair assessment. But I can say from an enrollment services standpoint and in conversations in enrollment management and conversations with my colleagues, we do have some other challenges that have been difficult. Um, I mentioned the placement challenges. There are more than six different ways students can place into courses, and that information is coming in from all areas. And I just wanna throw some numbers out. You, nobody needs to write these down, but we have roughly 4,000 applications for the fall 2020 semester currently. That's 4,000 applications. Each one of those applications requires two supplemental documents. So that's more than 10,000 documents right there. 
all of those documents are being reviewed and processed by the registrar's and admissions office. I want to just make a note here. The admissions team currently having lost our associate director is one full time staff member and three ESCs who split their time across the three offices. So that's a lot of processing, a lot of data entry, a lot of behind the scenes work to ensure that students are being placed in their courses. That leads directly into the third challenge of communication. Having all that information coming in, high school transcripts coming from the student, from the high school, from Naviance through our digital transcript delivery parchment, it is very difficult. Oh, can we go back? Sorry, can't. Thank you. It's very difficult to relay this information to students when you're relying on phone and email. It's not always the easiest thing to do. Um, I know my, my colleagues in advising are feeling this right now. Uh, email and phone is not always the easiest when you're dealing with eager students and sometimes parents. Uh, we definitely felt it about a month ago when we had the pack deadline on July 15th. Um, if you want to talk about phones ringing off the hooks and if there is an equivalent for email, I think we all felt it. So the communication piece has definitely been a challenge. And then the last one is staffing. Um, enrollment services in particular lost two critical and integral members of our team in July. Um, peak enrollment, so that's tough. Uh, people moving, leaving, changing roles. Um, there's always a learning curve and especially with new technology coming out. Um, so it's really kind of about taking all of these challenges, learning and, and moving forward um, to ensure that we can do the best that we can. Next slide, Karen. So with moving forward um, in talking strategy with enrollment management, I have three key um, concepts here. The first is collaboration. Um, enrollment does not lie in student affairs. Um, Associate Dean Vrendenberg and I talk almost daily, if not every couple days, about course offerings in the course schedule. Um, if you were to look at our course schedule right now, there's not very many seats available for students to register for. Um, many folks don't realize that we pick up 20%, if not 25% of our enrollments in the last month before classes start. So while you know courses seem like they're not filling, in that last month they definitely do fill. So it's a constant dialogue and a constant conversation and collaboration with academic affairs and student affairs to make sure that we have seats and to make sure that we're bringing students in. The second piece here is enhancing the enrollment pipeline and partnerships. Um, I mentioned some of the challenges that we've identified, uh, particularly in a virtual environment, um, and it's taking those and turning them into learning experiences and moving forward, um, enhancing our communications throughout the entire process. One of the beautiful things about our new CRM tool is that it has automated communications plans. So if a student starts their application but forgets to hit submit, they get this really gentle reminder saying, hey, it looks like you forgot something. Um, so it is really nice to have that added tool, especially when we have so many other kind of shifting priorities within the enrollment uh, services area. Um, but it really is about enhancing that pipeline and strengthening our partnerships on campus, um, ensuring that we have close working relationships with those key offices. Um, to make sure that things run smoothly for the students in the end result. And the last thing I wanted to touch upon about moving forward is shifting the culture. Um, I think often, and you know, I don't want to turn a, a positive into a negative, but often we are so quick to, to place blame or ask questions uh, without knowing really what we're asking. And I think we have to shift the culture to engage in a conversation and to learn um, about you know, what it means for enrollment, how we can increase our enrollment, you know, what our strategies are, what we need to be looking for, you know, and tactics to move forward. Um, one of those things is, you know, perhaps enhancing our high school partnerships or our relationships with the high schools. Um, there's so many things that we can be, but it's really shifting the culture. Um, for a long time, you know, we were very, very, very fortunate to have this kind of, if you build it, they will come. And now we really need to kind of go out there and start telling our story and reminding people why MCC is the great the great place that it is. 
Um, and we just need to get back to that and shift the culture and help folks understand that we do have the best, I'm gonna say, we do have the best community college and I truly believe that. Um, and that's really our plan in moving forward and ensuring that we can enhance um, our enrollment once again. Next slide. So I just wanted to leave this up here very quickly. Um, these are our key contacts for the enrollment services offices. Um, obviously, you know, most of you uh, know me, please feel free to reach out to me. Um, but we do have a brand new hire in the admissions office. Um, unfortunately, our former associate director, uh, Samantha Plourd, has taken a, a position at Middlesex for the year. So we have an interim hire with Jeanette Rivera Epps, and I, I apologize, I spelled her name incorrect. There's only one N. Um, we are working on getting her email address situated. Um, she does currently work at Gateway, so there's some some tech, uh, technological things we have to do there. Um, but our registrar's office, led by Anita Sparrow, financial aid with uh, Anna Torres, uh, our one of our rock star ESCs, Mariah Thomas, um, who handles all of our transcript evaluations. And I would be remiss to finish this presentation without giving a shout out to my to our ESCs. Um, right now, they are keeping our admissions office afloat. So if you see them on campus, if you're in a meeting uh, with them, please feel free to give them a pat on the back because they are uh, definitely keeping me afloat and keeping the admissions office afloat without having that associate director in place. Um, I'm Deb Wood in our senior registration. So for those of you who aren't aware, today is senior registration day. Um, I am certain Deb is probably not on this call because we have been getting inundated with calls and requests for senior registration. And then I also have our general questions in general email addresses. Um, I think oftentimes folks think that these are dead end email addresses, but I can tell you that each one of these for admissions, registrar and for financial aid, the director sees all of them. Uh, so I can tell you Gen Info Registrar goes to Anita herself. Uh, fine aid also, uh, jo I believe it's, you know, all three, Jody, Anna, and Janitza see that. MA admissions goes to your full admissions team, including myself. Um, and Takia Lugo has been a rock star in responding to all of our requests there. Um, so those are the key contacts for enrollment services. And that is all I have for you this morning. So thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Next is going to be Dr. Fatma Salman in regards to academic affairs and student affairs. I want to say good morning. Still good morning. Feels like, you know, afternoon to me, but still good morning. Good morning. Um, just want to start with just some highlights. But before I go ahead with the highlights, according to the stuff I already emailed, uh, all points, faculty, and also the stuff that I you know, um, asked to be posted on our web page at MCC website. So I just want to start with thank you, thanking all of you for making me welcomed and also for the well wishes since I already took the new role. I want to also express that I'm so proud of the way our faculty, staff, and student have supported each other during the transition, during this pandemic. I'm also inspired by the response of our community in facing the many challenges related to the pandemic. I took this new role in July 31st, so I feel you, I hear you, some of the concerns that I had when I was a faculty versus now as I'm an admin or your new interim dean. So these challenges that I have to now try to make sure I have an answer for or try to look for answers for. Next slide, please. Thank you, Karen. So as you heard from um, the CEO, and you also will hear from me, that we're deeply committed to creating an inclusive and equitable campus environment and hope to promote accessibility and collaboration among our faculty, staff, and students. 
we all now, as you can see, we talked about it. We understand the significance of diversity and the celebration of differences. We want to listen to the many perspectives of the college community and develop positive outcomes and relationship. So you email, you have good ideas. Please try to reach us. Emails, call, you know, my office door is open as well. At any time, call me, please, or email me if you have any ideas to move forward. So please let us know. So really quick highlights and updates. I shared many of these stuff with you already. So just because of the questions that I got even after sharing this information. So just highlight a few things before, you know, uh, we move on. So masks and social distancing are mandatory. So faculty, students, should wear masks at all time if they are teaching in a contact with any students. The only time you can take the mask off, according to what I know, if you are in your office and have no contact contact with anybody. The other thing I want to and also just making sure that you know the mask and social distancing policy, it's already on. I shared it with all points and it's also on our COVID-19 web page on MCC website. So if you want to refer to it on your syllabi to the link, absolutely. You want to put something on your syllabi. I know the syllabi will get it. It gets longer and longer, longer up to this point, but you can also post it on, you know, Blackboard or attach the link just briefly and attach the link that for our web page on your syllabi as well. This is just to, you know, take less space. The other thing I want to highlight as well, and uh, it's unfortunately up to this point, there will be no testing for commuter students, staff and faculty, and I'm pretty sure all of you heard about it already. Hopefully that will change, but this is what we have up to this point. I also share, shared some information about the new policy, the system office um, having for fall 2020, because we'll not have the UF uh, option for fall 2020. This is why we're moving forward, you know, with the MP uh, policy, which is um, no academic participation. And the faculty, I sent some information more to come, which is like uh, a sheet for FAQs, uh, possible questions you might have with some answers. Um, also, like uh, training for faculty, how it is done. So all of the all of these information coming hopefully will be this week. I will share it. So as I get it from the system office, they have a draft, but they are finalizing it and they will send it to us. So when I get it, I will send it to um, to faculty as well. So the deadline just heads up the deadline to report um, the no academic engagement or the NP. It's September 11 for traditional classes, and this is just before the census because the census will be um, September 16th. Some of you might ask, how about the late classes? It will be within also two weeks of the start date of these classes. Um, also, I shared FERPA and online teaching guidelines. It's also on our MCC COVID web page. I get some questions and I will reflect on this as I move and I will make it brief because I know how busy you are during this time and how precious your time is. The other thing I want to update you, so some of you ask, you might ask up to this point uh, the, about the transferability. So is our online cr uh, classes credit transferable to other state universities? So we had a meeting with provost, the deans and the provost, uh, and they are verbally agreed on, you know, of course, uh, the transfer of our online classes. But we're still, you know, um, looking for UConn and private institutions as well. Something also heads up for 
we're working you know on it and uh, we're just looking at the documentation coming to us as deans from the system office is Proctorio. Proctorio is a, a remote testing tool. It will be available to community college faculty to use. So more information I will send to you. Just you know, heard about it in my th all these information I just heard about, and I just you know uh, got them in that three weeks. I'm um, almost three weeks in my um, in my office or in my room. So there is a Proctoria for you know there is so many concerns as you know about the online uh, classes and how we could be able to um, make sure uh, those the rigor still there and the students who's taking the test is the real the, the, the real student that should take the test. So this is why this is uh, coming. Uh, the other thing I also uh, have been aware of. There is also a procedure, the new procedure for reasonable accommodation under the American with Disability Act or ADA. So if you have to go through this, please contact HR. Next slide, please. So I highlighted and updated everything like the bullets that I have on the previous slide. These slides that's coming just making sure according to the questions after I shared the information or the documents, all the policies, I still get some questions about um, the MP. And like I said, there are more documents to be shared as I get them from the system office. Just in the slide briefly, this why it's the they have to move to the NB, like what is it? And there are so much you know, into this, uh, why they had they have to adapt this new policy financially and, you know, academically anyway. So I put some slides here also for some of you. It's already in the document that I shared with you, but I just highlight them in for you slides here and I will share this with all faculty after, you know, uh, today, sometimes today. So you feel free to look at these again or to look at the actual documents I, I shared with you. So. Um, if we move to the next slide, please. Uh, this is just one of the questions and also the answer was, you know, in the document, like what is exactly the academic engagement um, uh, assessment? Like, like what is it? So how we just go and report our students, you know, uh, participating or not participating in the class by uh, September 11. It is included but not limited to all these here like physically attending a class, submitting an academic assignment, taking a quiz or exam or an interactive to, you know, all of these here could be considered to be uh, an academic engagement for students. Next slide, please. But what is not included or is not academic, you know, engagement activity, logging into an online class without active participation or participating in academic counseling or advising. This is not considered to be academic um, engagement activity. Next slide, please. Also, I got some questions on uh, the FERBA that I shared with you. So if I'm recording my class, what should I put in my syllabi? So there is a statement here, as you see, it's also included in the actual document that I shared with you and also on our website. So you're welcome to take this. <clears throat> Excuse me. You're welcome to put it on your syllabi, but I like many of you expressed to me that's, you know, the syllabus is getting longer and longer and this is too much. You can, like I said, briefly take some of these or refer to it, you know, to our web, uh, to our website, to the link on our website or you can put this also on Blackboard. Make sure if you're recording the class and you're posting it on Blackboard and student participating, just make sure you announce at the beginning of the class that you're recording the class and the session will be uploaded on Blackboard for educational purposes only. Next slide, please. Also, if there was another creative way to look at, you know, as the deans of the community colleges, they had a statement such as this one. And I said, like, you know, I'm not going to read the whole thing, but also you're welcome to use this one as well. 
um, you know, so the previous one that's already included in the document or the statement here as well, but just make sure, you know, you're led the student aware of it. And like I said, I will share the PowerPoint presentation with all of you sometimes today. Next, please. Um, I mentioned Proctorio, the, the, the work in progress and more documentation will be provided. It will be like where you see the black uh, Blackboard collaborate under you hit on course to tools. It will be there as well. This is what I know up to this point, so it will be element uh, implemented. Sorry, implemented under the course tools on Blackboard for faculty to use and up to this point I know it's optional for faculty to use but like I said more documentation and in this slide here is just showing why they have you know the system office have to look at uh, tools to just make sure you know uh, we're for uh, you can see a transfer transferability issues preparation for you know uh, Lancer's exams or student progress or integrity of course grades or you know the integrity of the assessment as well. So this is just briefly shows you, you know, uh, due to the concerns, um, you know, based on the surveys they have. So they move forward to finding something that help faculty to ensure uh, this is in place. Um, next slide, please, Karen. This is also briefly, as as I mentioned uh, in the updates and, hi and highlights that I have for you, um, you know, the procedure for requesting reasonable accommodation under the ADA. Uh, I said just please contact um, HR and it's also included the, the procedure and the process and the few slides to come. So this is I will conclude with that. If you have any question, please let me know. Um, call, email, and you also know the chart of, you know, the MCC organization as our uh, CEO shared at the beginning. So you already know where to email or to call. And like I said, feel free at any time to contact me. And I wish you all the best. And I know how stressful this time is. And I actually feel the pressure at the moment that, you know, you have to after, you know, I'm the the last one to speak, right, Karen? And um, so you have to go and do your, um, you know, what you have to do. So just wishing you all the best. Please stay safe and healthy. And if you have any concerns, issues, or any initiatives, please let us know. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful day and a great start of a semester.